So we have two presenters up uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, on my um, the guy, the first guy here uh, is Brother Ricky Kearns. He was born in apartheid era South Africa. He is a bring, brings unique blend of personal experience and expertise in the history of liberty of conscience as a naturalized U.S. citizen. Since graduating with a Master's in Divinity in 2004, he's been a medical missionary and a church planter with his wife Carmen and their children Eliana and Tobin. He is guided by the great controversy theme in scripture and a growing appreciation for the Adventist pioneers, and he navigates roles as a husband, father, nurse, and student of scripture, history, and prophecy, shedding light on the foundation of personal beliefs and societal freedoms rooted in the life and death of Jesus Christ. He was a witness to apartheid's consequences firsthand, and he draws parallels between historical struggles and the ongoing quest for autonomy in a post-COVID world, intertwining his experiences, theological reflection, historical insights, and a newfound prophetic perspective. With empathy from nursing and a conviction forged in the past three years, Brother Kearns highlights the importance of safeguarding individual rights and beliefs in the face of adversity, in connecting his own journey with the cosmic conflict around us and emphasizing the enduring importance and significance of religious liberty. Sitting next to him, we have Brother Ron Duffield, who plays multiple roles, wears multiple hats. He is a husband, he is a father, he is a respiratory therapist and an author with a passion for Adventist history, for righteousness by faith and for liberty of conscience. Brother Duffield grew up in the Northwest, worked as a respiratory therapist in Walla Walla for several years before attending Weimar College, where he met his wife, Sherry, and spent nearly 15 years working at the New Start program at Weimar and as the college librarian. In 2004, Brother Duffield moved with his wife and their three daughters to Dixie, Washington, where Brother Duffield currently works in the local hospital. He has authored two books, which I cannot recommend strongly enough, The Return of the Latter Rain and Wounded in the House of His Friends, and Brother Duffield presents seminars on Adventist history and liberty of conscience topics. Now please bow your heads with me and we ask for God's blessing upon these two preachers. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gifts that you've given Brother Duffield and Brother Kearns. And Father, I thank you that religious liberty is intertwined with righteousness by faith. And so now, Father, as our brothers present, I pray that the gospel will take root in our hearts once again and we can appreciate Jesus and all his beauty and his glory for what he did for us on Calvary. So may your blessing rest upon this session now. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you, uh, Brother Conrad. I just wanted to start, uh, as Ricky and I we be begin here, to uh, thank the Village Church. And here's why. During, two years ago, during probably one of the darkest times in my adult life and my family's life, I was facing not only the loss of my job, but the loss of my career. And while that was happening, I was busy working as a, as a respiratory therapist in the hospital setting on an almost daily basis with dying patients trying to keep them alive. while at the same time working in a system that is bankrupt in treating preemptively the conditions they had. And while that was happening, I was being identified in my own church's review as a jihadist and akin to David Koresh because I had the audacity to believe that because I had had COVID, my own immune system that God gave me was better than an experimental vaccination. And it was in the midst of that trial that the village church offered a different narrative. And I cannot thank you enough for that. It also, though, I'm very thankful for the experience because it woke Ricky and I up to how little we have known about liberty of conscience. And I have been talking about Adventist history and writing on it for 25 years, and somehow I missed a lot of this 
issue of liberty of conscience. In my mind, liberty of conscience was Sunday laws somewhere off in the future. And through this experience and reading, I realize how little I've known and I cannot read enough as I continue to learn. So I think both of us can say that we feel like we're in the creator role, but what we're presenting today, we hope will be the same kind of blessing that it has been to us as we've been studying and reading. And Ricky's gonna start off and then I'll come up again and uh, finish the presentation. Two years ago, I was sitting as um, one of you are sitting right there, and with me was a dear friend by the name of Raymond Joseph. Raymond Joseph is the voice of the Adventist pioneers. If you go into Adventist pioneers or Ellen White audio, and you listen to anything on uh, the American Sentinel that was recorded, you'll hear the voice of Raymond Joseph, and he was sitting probably right beyond where Ron was sitting. And the, after the last meeting about this time of the evening, we walked out, I was standing over the booth, and he had helped me to pass out, pass out what is patriotism? Something that the two of us had been passing out for years. Every 4th of July, we'd get a whole stack of what is patriotism, Wherever we were, we'd go down to a, uh, to a, a fair, uh, a parade, 4th of July parade, and pass out what is patriotism. I want to thank the Lord for that experience because after he walked out here, he went to his hotel room and his lovely wife called me and said, Ricky, he's, he's collapsed. And five hours later, he was no more. But she tells me that that was the best day of his life in the context of liberty of conscience because he, more than anyone, was the one to be able to open to my eyes the importance of liberty of conscience. And so I want you to honor him by honoring his wife who's right over here, and I'm gonna ask her to stand. I haven't asked her before, but that's, that's Buffy. Buffy, just stand. I just want to thank you for the work that you and Raymond did in, in the context of liberty of conscience uh, in my life, and so thank you so much. My part is to do the introduction, and as Ron says, that my eyes have been opened They've been opened to the, um, the, uh, the, the commonness of liberty of conscience in, Adventist, in our Adventist story, but yet my myopia, my blindness, more, more, not my myopia, just my blindness to it. And so our uh, presentation is religious liberty in the 1888 experience. George Santayana in the year 1905 says this, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Will, uh, uh, Churchill turned into those who cannot, uh, th those who uh, forget the past are condemned to repeat it. But Ellen White put it, this principle of history this way, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us in the past. That is history. That is the dates. That is the places. That is the, the things. And he's teaching in our past history. That is his instruction, his 
his counsel, his, his, his doctrine. So there's two aspects. There's his, his, the history and his teaching. Many times we focus on just the history and not this beautiful co combination, symbiosis of history and teaching. So we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us in the past and his teaching in our past history. Elliot J. Wagner and Alonzo T. Jones. We learned about Alonzo T. Jones this morning. Elliot Wagner and Alonzo T. Jones had this interesting experience in that each, uh, uh, Jones says, each of us pursued his own individual study of the Bible and the teachings and preaching. Never in their lives did we spend an hour in study together in any subject or upon all subjects. Yet we were led in perfect agreement in truths of the Bible all the way. Significant, amazing, the way how the Lord led these two individuals. And what does the Bible say? On the testimony of two shall a thing be established. So these were not only students of the Bible, but they were also students of prophecy, which is a perspective in the Bible uh, that Elliot, jo uh, Elliot Wagner put it together in his first book was Prophetic Lights. And Alonzo T. Jones published Sacred Chronology. Here is an amazing thing. Prophetic, uh, Prophetic Lights was published in 1888, prior to the 1888 meetings in Minneapolis. So prophecy was a part of their, their study before Righteousness by Faith, for which we know them. So there we have prophetic lights. Sacred chronology was a republishing of S. Sylvester Bliss's book, Sacred Chronology, and Jones added to that the peopling of the earth, which is a, a chapter on Genesis 11, Genesis 10. So, so, so the point is that both of them were interested in prophecy as a focus. We find that not only were they interested in prophecy as a focus, but the man in the middle was J.H. Wagner, and he was the dad of E.J. Wagner. And it's wonderful when a dad and the son can work together. And, they, and the three of them formed a, a strand of three, and they published in 1886 the American Sentinel. They started with the American Sentinel, 1886. The American Sentinel was a, was a publication focused specifically on what we call religious liberty. But it's on the back side of the American Sentinel that we get an insight into what, in their terms, the focus would be. And this is what the focus was for them. On every issue that I could find, in, is this little devoted to the American Sentinel, an eight-page monthly journal, devoted to the defense of American institutions, the preservation of the United States Constitution as it is, so far as regards religion or religious tests and the maintenance of human rights. both civil and religious. I'm going to pause there because our focus, when we say it's religious liberty, the implication is that conscience only has sway in the context of religion. But here we have a focus on the defense of the American uh, institutions and the preservation of the United States Constitution as it is so far as it regards religion or religious tests and the maintenance of human rights, both civil 
and religious. My question is, had this been the focus of our work and not called it the religious liberty department, but called it the liberty, the, the, the liberty of conscience department, how different would the 1960s have looked? That's not the focus of my talk, but I want to leave that there. The American Sentinel started in 1886, I said, and it stretched all the way to 1900. So you find 14 years of publications, and I couldn't find one edition without that little imprimatur, imprimatur of both civil and religious liberty. The, out of, um, out of the, the, the American Sentinel, they also flowed a whole series of, of, of books and articles. But the Liberty uh, magazine took the place of the American Sentinel after 1900. And here is an insight that has come very close to me and actually speaks to many of the areas that we've been dealing with this weekend. And here is what a subtitle of the Liberty magazine says. And I'm gonna read it for you. The emancipation of religion from the dogmatism of modern science. That raises another question for me. Had we, had our eyes been tuned to modern science's dogmatism, how differently would our legal response have been in the last three years? And how differently would our medical response have been in the last three years? That is my quick introduction, and here is the premise. Liberty of conscience includes both civil liberties and religious liberties. That is the new discovery that I've made in the last three years. I think there's a prophetic marker for that, but I'm exploring that and continue to study that. And with that, I will pass it on to Ron. Okay. So Ricky started with a statement about the purpose and the reason we should understand our past. Both secular people and, and uh, the Bible itself, actually, read uh, Psalm 78. The reason God gives us history is not only to teach us about the goodness of God, but to warn us from making the same mistakes as, as our forefathers. And Ellen White, uh, Ricky quoted that, that, we have nothing to fear unless we forget not only how God has led us, but how God dealt with the mistakes of the past and how he's warning us even through the mistakes and the victories, which path to follow. So I'm going to talk about some of the history of 1888 and following in regard to liberty of conscience, but I want to set the stage just a little bit. We haven't really talked yet today, I believe, about uh, an organization. 1863, as we all know, was the, the date when Seventh-day Adventists organized. Now, obviously, they'd been uh, Adventists since the Millerite movement, and here uh, Baptists and Methodists and Christian Connection people got together after study and the Lord's blessing and formed the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What we often forget or may not know about is that very year the NRA formed, and I'm not talking about the National Reform or the National Rifle Association. I'm talking about the National Reform Association. And there's something we need to understand. I won't have time to go into it in detail at all today, 
But we need to understand why the National Reform Association formed. And I was very thankful for Ron Knott's introductory in his talk and for other comments that have been made about how we look at evangelicals who are, I believe, rising up against legitimate concerns. And this is why the uh, National Reform Association formed the same year the Seventh-day Adventists organized. Notice, this is out of Eric Symes' book, the secularizing of America in the 1860s disturbed Protestant Americans who feared that liberals were de-Christianizing the country, and to organize support, they formed the National Reform Association on February 4, 1863. There was a moral decline in this country following the Great Disappointment. And you will read about that not only in our own church history books, but you will read about it, I've just found recently, even in the secular press. There was uh, spiritualism, Evolution started rising in this country. And I found in Uriah Smith's book, Marvel of Nation, socialism and communism also started to raise their head in this country during this time. And in response, the National Reform Association formed. So they were fighting or concerned about legitimate issues. It's just immediately they decided that the way to solve it was to go to the Caesar to enforce Christianity upon the nation. They lost the power of the gospel that changes people's hearts. So again, legitimate concern. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but Uriah Smith spends 20 pages showing how this liberal, conservative issue pendulum swung for 40 years and came to a peak he doesn't cover this part, but came to a pinnacle in 1888. After 1863, they immediately wanted to bring a change to the Constitution, and they were pushing for Sunday laws. And in response, liberalism immediately erupted. And in, then in response to that, conservative uh, national reform rose to the occasion, and the pendulum swung back and forth. Well. In 1879, after 16 years of attempting federal legislation, the NRA decided to go state by state, and it was immediately uh, effective. State by state they went, and there wasn't a state in the union or a territory that either didn't reenact already, Sunday laws that were already on the books, or legislate new laws that within just a short time uh, covered this country and all the states and territories at that time. 1,600 people were arrested in California alone in 1882, including W.C. White and J.H. Wagner over Sunday law issues. Just th 30 miles from my home, somebody was fined $25 at an Adventist camp meeting for having a kitchen open in violation of Sunday laws. But, so in 1879, as they went state by state, it became very uh, a positive effect for their movement. In 1888, only nine years later, it wasn't just a national reform, there was three other organizations that joined, and this was a powerful, what had started out as a grassroots movement that had covered the entire country where these groups were joined together to bring about uh, a change in our country to Christianize it. Again, they had legitimate reasons, but it's the way they were going about it. And we've already talked about the, the Blair Bill on May 21. It was a national Sunday law. Notice why they wanted to do it. It was a national Sunday law is needed to make the state laws complete and effective. That's all they were doing. But there was another, another bill on the 25th, four days later, Blair wanted to introduce this bill, and that was an amendment to the Constitution and the idea in this was to establish the Christian religion as a religion of the nation, and this to the exclusion of all other religions. Do you see how quickly what the founders of this country had instituted would have changed if this had gone through? And all of this set the context then, or the background to what Ellen White would title or call the most important meeting. Think about this. 
a general conference when all the leadership of this church would gather to then go out to the membership and share what God was intending to do at this conference. And Ellen White, based on some dreams she had that summer, had this to say when she wrote to the brethren in the summer of 1888. She said, we are impressed that this gathering will be the most important meeting you have ever attended. All selfish ambition should be laid aside and you should plead with God for his spirit to descend upon you as it came upon the disciples who were assembled together on the day of Pentecost. That is latter rain language. And I believe with all my heart that God not only intended, but he began to pour out the Holy Spirit in Minneapolis and following because he wanted to prepare this people for what was coming on the earth. Well, what about the presentation at Minneapolis? Now, I have, like I said, spent probably 25 years writing and speaking more recently on the topic of righteousness by faith or justification in a, in a history setting, not so much theologically, but just talking about how this was a message that came. But it's only recently that I realize that liberty of conscience was at the very foundation of that meeting that took place. Now, I, I realize I'm late to the game. Maybe all of you already understood this, but I will show you a few slides here of why I finally come to this conclusion recently as I've been reading books on liberty of conscience. This is W.C. Wright writing about two years after the conference to Dan Jones, the general conference secretary, and he's telling him, you know, it's the plans for the, the Minneapolis conference. And he says, early in 1888, I began corresponding with Elder Butler, general conference president, about the institute to precede the Minneapolis conference. I proposed four or five lines of work, among which were the duties of church officers, new advanced majors for carrying the message, the study of Bible doctrines, and then notice, included in that list, our religious liberty work, and one or two other lines, I can't recall. So even here, is evidence that the plan was even before the conference that liberty of conscience would be a subject talked about at Minneapolis. Well, uh, L a, a DeWitt Hottle, he was one of the delegates that went to the conference and he wrote notes. Unfortunately, they're very short, but he also indicates another indication that there were, in fact, I read this, this is one of the earliest things I read uh, about eight months ago, and I said, I can't believe this. They actually were talking about this at Minneapolis. In his note for October 18, he says, Elder Jones gave an excellent talk on national reform. And by the way, the word national reform is a, is a catchphrase for the whole religious liberty, liberty of conscience issues that were happening at that very time. Unfortunately, that's all he wrote. Uh, Ten days later, he writes, Brother Jones spoke on the national reform tonight. So we know that at least twice Jones presented. Now what happened was uh, Brother Hoddle got sick for 10 days, which he talks about, so he missed all the meetings. But we know that at least twice Jones presented at Minneapolis on the topic of liberty of conscience or religious liberty in regard to national reform. Well, again, about eight months ago, I have a book on my shelf, not this new cover, called Civil um, Government and Religion. It's been sitting there for decades, and I decided, you know, I have never read that. I need to read it. So I pulled it off the shelf, and I opened to the preface, because I figured that's where I should start. And to my astonishment, this is what is stated there. This little work is the outgrowth of several lectures upon the relationship between religion and the civil power delivered in Minneapolis, Minnesota in October 1888. He's talking about at the General Conference in this little work of 168 pages for Jones. The interest manifested in this subject and numerous requests for the publication of the main points of the arguments presented have led to the issuing of this pamphlet. So this is literally some of what was presented in Minneapolis and I had been totally unaware of that. By the way, Jonathan Zirkel and Ron Knott's talk this morning shows you some of the arguments Jones gave in Washington, D.C. come right out of this book. And that obviously was what 
part of what was presented in Minneapolis. Well, there's another uh, letter that I was familiar with, but somehow had missed this. It's a letter written by A.T. Jones two years before he passed away to a brother Holmes, and he's talking about Minneapolis. He says, Sister White stood out openly and strongly all the way for righteousness by faith. And then he continues, and it was given the greater force by the message of religious liberty at Minneapolis. Righteousness by faith at Minneapolis was given greater force because it was presented in the context of liberty of conscience. Then he, keeps, he continues, then when camp meetings time came, 1889, we all three, Jones, Wagner, and Ellen White, visited the camp meetings with the message of righteousness by faith and religious liberty. Sometimes all three of us being in the same meeting, this turned the tide with the people. And I have spent many a presentation talking about the revivals that resulted during 1889 as a result of the preaching of righteousness by faith. But I have never included the thought that it actually was based on and included with the talk on, on liberty of conscience. Now I want to focus on what happened when Jones left and Ellen White left Battle Creek to go to, I mean, left Minneapolis to go to Battle Creek. November 4, the Minneapolis conference ended, and they left there for Battle Creek. Both of them coming from California, by the way. Ellen White hadn't been back to Battle Creek since her husband died in 81, that I know of. Jones was coming from California because he'd been offered a job at the college, which I will mention here in a moment. But something happened which kind of set the stage before they even got there from Minneapolis and both W.C. White and Ellen White talk about what happened. Our experience here in Battle Creek immediately after the conference was more interesting than edifying. Some who returned from the conference before it was done had given out that A.T. Jones was a crank. And it seemed as though it would break their hearts to have the people think otherwise. So before the, the conference even ended, people came to Battle Creek to tell them A.T. Jones is a crank. Now, I don't know about you, I don't use the word crank very often, but it, it means an extremist or someone who's focused only on themselves or kind of just exaggerates a, a topic or something like that. Now, I was familiar again with this story, but I thought it was just in the context of his thoughts on righteousness by faith. I found out it really had not, it wasn't involving righteousness by faith, which you will see here in a moment. There were also a number, this is Ellen White, s saying the same thing. There were also a number of delegates who returned to Battle Creek before us who were forward to make reports of the meeting at Minneapolis, giving their own incorrect version of the matter, which was unfavorable to Brethren Jones, Wagner, W.C. White, and myself. So it wasn't just Jones, it was all of them, basically, who had come from California. Now, Ellen White didn't describe the train of events that I want to go through with you. And the whole point is, how does this apply today for us? How should this teach us today as a people? So Ellen White talks about, she comes back from Minneapolis to Battle Creek, first time she's been there in years, and she's invited to speak at the Dime Tabernacle. And this is what happened. I was invited to speak the next Sabbath, November 10, in the Tabernacle, but afterwards, because the impressions were so strong that I had changed, I think the brother felt a little sorry he had asked me. Two elders from the church visited me on Sabbath morning, and I was asked by one what I was going to speak upon. I said, brethren, you leave that matter to the Lord and Sister White, for neither the Lord nor Sister White will be dictated to by the brethren as to what subject she will bring before them. I am at home in Battle Creek on the ground, and we ask not permission to take to the desk in the tabernacle. I take it as my rightful position according me of God. So here's even the prophet of God being questioned on what she's allowed to teach or preach from the pulpit at the heart of the work. 
Now, if I was one of those elders, I would have felt a little sheepish after she answered. But Ellen White, the story doesn't stop here. She goes on. She says, but there is Brother Jones who cannot feel as I do and who will wait for an invitation from you. You should do your duty in regard to this matter and open the way before him. Notice the response. The elders stated that they did not feel free to invite him to speak until they consulted Brother Smith to know whether he should sanction it, for Elder Smith was older than they. Ellen White said, then do it at once. Time is precious, and there is a message to come to this people, and the Lord requires you to open the way for the light to come to this to the people of God. So they are sent with an assignment to go ask Elder Smith. Notice what happened. Well, days passed, and there came no invitation. Actually, it was almost two weeks. For Elder Jones to present in the large church in the Battle Creek and the message given him of God. Do you notice all the qualifiers about this message? Is there any question about whether Ellen White endorsed what Jones was talking about? I sent for the elders of the church and I ask again if they designed to give Elder Jones an opportunity to speak to the people. The answer was, I have consulted Brother Smith and he has decided it would not be best to ask him because Jones took strong positions and carried the subject of righteousness by faith too far. Is that what it says? That's how I've somehow read this story for 20 years. I I don't know how I missed this. The reason Jones was being kept out of the tabernacle was because of what he was talking about in regard to liberty of conscience. Well, Ellen White's response, and you'll read her talk about this in many places. She says, I then felt my spirit stirred within me, and I bore a very plain testimony to these brethren. I told them a little of how matters had been carried on at Minneapolis and stated the position I had taken, that Pharisaism had been at work leavening the camp here in Battle Creek, and the Seventh-day Adventist churches were affected. That was the result of this attitude. By the way, this is cancel culture a hundred years ago, plus. Well, Ellen White, in another letter two years later, three years later, she's writing about it, actually to Uriah Smith, who claimed he hadn't done what he had done. And by the way, I would say, Uriah Smith, I have a newfound appreciation for his work on on, uh, prophecy and reading Marvel Nations but it also increases the sadness in realizing that he fought against the very things he had stood for before, which should be a warning to every one of us. We're all capable of falling if we're not being led by the Lord. So Ellen White continues, here's another place she's talking about what happened. She said, Brethren Prescott, Amadon, and Sicily brought a united testimony on this matter, which called forth from me about a 15-minute talk as pointed and in earnest as I have ever made in my life. I answered, well, if Elder Smith takes that position, God will surely remove him out of the way. For God has not given him the authority to say what shall come into the tabernacle from our own people and what should not. But if he holds that position, notice, we will secure a hall in the city And the words God has given Brother Jones to speak to the people shall have, the people shall have them. So Ellen White was at the point, if you don't let him in here, you don't have authority to do that. If you don't, we'll rent a hall so that this message can be given. That's how strong she felt about this. Well, W.C. White writes to his wife, he also stayed over in uh, Battle Creek because he had been elected temporary general conference president until uh, O.A. Olson got there. He writes to Mary, he says, after we had been here about two weeks, Mother and I ask why they did not get Jones to speak in the tabernacle, notice, on national reform. Cicely said that he had asked Smith and he thought that Jones was rather extravagant in his expressions. 
and he hardly thought it best to ask him to speak. Well, you can guess what, that when Mother had a chance to talk to Brother Cicely and Abin, that she told them her mind quite fully, and I truly believe she did. <laughs> About that sort of planning, Abin did not sympathize with the opposition, and he stirred around and he gave out an appointment for Sabbath and Sunday evenings at the tabernacle. It took two weeks but the door was finally opened. I, I submit to you that if Ellen White had not been there, this never would have happened. Well, W.C. White continues telling his wife what happened. He says, well, A.T. Jones, speaking on Sunday, November 18, did real well. Judge Graves, Ed Nichols, and several other prominent citizens were there and were much pleased. John Fulton stirred around and got an order for 1,500 copies of the journal. So here you have citizens from the town of Battle Creek, non-Adventists, coming to the meetings now where Jones is finally allowed to talk about religious liberty issues, and there are citizens that are listening and encouraged and excited about what they hear. But what's this 1,500 journals he's talking about? Well, the Battle Creek Daily Journal, the, journal of the, 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 the secular journal in Battle Creek, published his sermons for the entire community. You won't find them in the review, but you'll find them in the secular press. The first of a series of lectures on the national constitution and religion and the state was delivered last Sunday night, November 18, in the Tabernacle by A.T. Jones, editor of the American Sentinel, before a large audience. 3,300 people could sit in that tabernacle which the speaker held to an intense interest, we are happy to present to our readers the following report of the address. And then there's the sermon in the Battle Creek Journal. A week later, they printed his second presentation. The reason it's a week later is because he and Ellen White went to Potterville for six days and presented a whole series probably similar to what he was presenting here in Battle Creek. And then he returned to finish a series here in Battle Creek. December 5, on Wednesday, a few days later, the paper also prints his third sermon on the important series of discourses upon relation of religion to the state was delivered by A.T. Jones. The very, lar the very large and deeply attentive audience which have attended these lectures are as indicative of the great interest taken in them by our citizens as they are complimentary of the able and eloquent manner in which the subject has been presented. Mr. Jones, in the third lecture, spoke over two hours, holding his audience in breathless attention throughout. And I wish we had time to show you the comparison of how the secular press described him and how he was being described by our own people of which, by the way, is still being repeated even to this day. Well, on Sabbath 8, there's three homework articles. I'm coming to the end here. You need to read. I only have time to give a couple paragraphs. David's Prayer, Review and Herald, December 18, 1888. This is the sermon Ellen White preached December 8, three days after Jones's third sermon. She preached this at the tabernacle. This is taken from her sermon. An amendment to our Constitution is being urged in Congress, and when it is obtained, oppression must follow. I want to ask, are you awake to this matter? Shall we let the religious amendment movement come in and thus shut us away from the privileges and right? God help us to arouse from the stupor that has hung over us for years. Next day, she writes to a brother, uh, Healy, and she says, this church in Battle Creek is like the Valley of Dry Bones. They need to be stirred with some power to give them life. Why, we have had to work and pray and work even to have Brother Jones obtain a hearing in Battle Creek, and many of our leading men were provoked after they heard him talk. Men who had been told a certain story about Jones, and then when they actually heard him talk, they were provoked that they almost missed out on a message because if they had continued to believe the rumors that were going around. By the way, that same thing is happening today. About this church. Well, on December 11, the Battle Creek Journal printed, reprinted all three of Jones' sermons because it, they, there was so 
much, so many people wanting copies of them. Here's the second article you need to read, and I'm gonna have to jump to the last, the slide here. It's called The Approaching Crisis, December 11, 1888. It's also reprinted in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 711 to 718. This was in the review. There's three of them right during this period, and Ellen White is begging those there in Battle Creek to wake up. She says, but too often the leader has stood hesitatingly, seeming to say, let us not be too great haste. There may be a mistake. We must not be careful to raise a false alarm. The very hesitancy and uncertainty on his part is crying peace and safety. Thus, he virtually denies the message sent from God. So while God sends a message, there's a resistance, not from the world, yes, probably there was, but also coming from within. Well, December 13, thankful that Jonathan and uh, Ron Knott went through this. Jones leaves Battle Creek, goes back to D.C., and then back to Battle Creek. So that happened during this very time. On December 18, this is the third article you need to read. December 18, Ellen White writes an article in defense of the American Sentinel, written during this very time. December 18, uh, 1888, the American Sentinel and its mission. She encouraged them. There had been a resistance, though, to the Sentinel, and she describes it there. Well, thankfully, there was a revival. It took a month and a half, a week of prayer, December 15 to 22, that ended up going for three extra weeks after, and Jones and Corliss and others preached on the topic of justification by faith, but again, it was in the context of religious amendment to the Constitution, and that's what gave it power. Now I want to end with two, two slides. I showed you this one at the beginning where Jones talks about towards the end of his life what the message was, but I left out the last sentence. It turned the tide with the people and apparently with the leading men. But this latter was only apparent. It was never real for all the time in the General Conference Committee and amongst others there was a secret antagonism always carried on. And I tell you that's to our own shame. This is not to point a finger out there, but I tell you if we take the spirit of Daniel, we should be praying the prayer of Daniel 9 for our own church. And Jones is spot on. There was resistance to liberty of conscience for years. November 4, 1890, Salamanca Vision, Ellen White was in New York. She was shown what was going on in Battle Creek at the heart of the work. The context of that vision was in regard to liberty of conscience and the American Sentinel. She had a dream five months before the meeting she saw in dream took place at the General Conference, 1891. And in the morning when she revealed what she had saw, seen, she had no idea that the meeting she was describing took place the night before and the meeting was to cancel the American Sentinel. The biggest proof that she was being led of God, two weeks later, they voted to send her to Australia. And this is the final slide. She's writing in this context. Methods and plans would be devised that God did not sanction. And yet Elder Olson, conference president, made it appear that the decisions of the general conference were as the voice of God. Many of the positions taken going forth as the voice of the general conference have been the voice of one, two, or three men who are misleading the conference. There were things in regard to Sunday work, in regard to the color line, in regard to the American Sentinel that had better never have been introduced at the 1891 conference. The Lord did not preside in many meetings. By the way, if you think this is an isolated statement, there are many more dealing with this very subject of overstepping authority. And again, I would say, in closing, I don't know how all this history should speak to you, but it tells me that part of the reason we're still here a hundred years later is because we haven't kept step with God who was intending to pour out the latter rain on this church. And if we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the, of the past, we need to learn from our history.